What if I told you that if you lived here in Toronto, you could go through the entire winter without ever having to go outside? That's thanks to the Toronto Path Network, the world's largest underground pedestrian path network thing. You might call it a mall, you might call it a pedestrian network, let's just call it the path. The path is an incredible thing that connects to a lot of transit facilities, different destinations, and everything in between. But the question is, should more cities build things like it? Let's look at the path and talk about that. If you're not already, consider subscribing to get more content like this. And if you're not already, consider supporting the channel via YouTube memberships or Patreon to help me bring you more videos. So to be perfectly clear, the Toronto Path is an underground network that connects the downtown financial core of Toronto with various subway stations, office buildings, malls, tourist attractions, stadiums, all kinds of different stuff all connected to this pedestrian network. Now the network is over 30 kilometers long and it's not just this barren wasteland, it has over a thousand shops and services throughout it. It feels a lot like a mall, but maybe a bit more cramped. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, the transit connections to the path are really impressive. There are six different subway stations on the Young University Spadina line, the U-shaped line that goes through downtown Toronto that connect directly to the path. Basically, you exit the subway station and you're directly inside a building underground. The PATH network is also connected to Toronto Union Station, from which you can go to the airport, meaning that yes, you can land in Toronto, get on an airport train, go see a Toronto Maple Leafs game, stay in your hotel, go to some tourist attractions, and head back to uh, wherever you traveled from without ever having to step outside. And that's actually pretty cool, especially in a city that has, again, harsh winters and really, really muggy hot summers. There's also, of course, national rail service and regional rail service from Go Transit, as well as the new indoor Union Station bus terminal. So there is a ton of different indoor transit offerings in the downtown Toronto core. Now, what I think is so amazing about the Toronto Path, and something that I think we really need to think about more, is how it helps transit compete better with private cars. If it's the middle of winter in Toronto, it can be attractive to get in a car just so that you don't have to walk from, say, your bus stop or your streetcar stop or the subway station to your final destination. But this is where the path comes in. Once you're coming into downtown Toronto, likely on the subway, but possibly on a streetcar, it's at most a short walk to the nearest building to get underground and to have access to basically the entire downtown core and most of the places you'd want to go without having to step outside. In the same way that if you're driving a car, you'd be able to drive straight to the building you want to go to, get into the parkade, and never have to step out into rain or snow or extreme heat, you can ride transit and directly get to the destination you want to get to, even if your trip requires a short walk at the end of it through the PATH network. Now, there are a ton of interesting features to the PATH. One of them is the way that it's so frequented by office workers. Now, in university, I spent a summer as an office working intern, and it was amazing the ability you had to access all kinds of different food options, different services, and the like, without even having to leave your building, which was really nice when it was incredibly hot out. Especially during inclement weather, the path really fills up, though it has been less busy during COVID-19. What I'd compare it to is kind of a giant mall, sort of like the pedestrian malls you sometimes see connected to subway stations in other cities, but just on an entirely different scale. And in fact, there's even residential buildings now that connect up to the path. And what this means is that indeed, you can literally go back to your apartment, sleep, wake up, walk over to your office building in the morning without ever having to step outside. And while this might sound a little weird and miserable if you're the outdoorsy type, in Toronto during winter, especially when the snow actually starts to melt, you will appreciate it. One of the coolest things for me when I lived in a building that was attached to the path was being able to go downtown and go to the mall without ever having to put a jacket on in the middle of winter. That was really cool. And there's an important point to make there, which is that the in-body transfers that Toronto has, where you can easily transfer from a bus or a streetcar 
onto the subway network, in many cases without having to go outside or at least get wet or covered in snow, if it's snowing or raining, are really cool because what they mean is that the second you get onto your transit vehicle in the morning, you don't have to worry about wearing your jacket or about getting soaked or covered in snow for the rest of the day because you'll be able to access your subway station without going outside in many cases, and you'll be able to access your final destination, be it an office or a concert downtown, again, without having to go outside. It's really cool. Now, to be clear, not the entire path is underground and newer sections are a lot nicer than older sections. The sections in the Toronto waterfront, mostly south of Union Station, are actually mostly elevated, which is a cool change of scenery. It lets you get really good views of the different city streets and some less nice areas as well. And the path isn't staying still. New developments like CIBC Square, which is the location of the Union Station bus terminal, are connecting up to the network to further expand it. And that's actually how the path largely developed. When a plot of land got developed to build an office tower, it was basically organized to link up to the adjacent path system and provide links to future adjacent plots. This way, most of the time when you see a major new development in downtown Toronto that's anywhere near the path, you see some sort of connection and expansion of the system. It's sort of decentralized in that way. Now to give you a sense of the scale of the path, you can walk for 40 minutes to an hour entirely within it, just walking from one end to the other. The southernmost end is around the waterfront, while the northernmost end is north of the Toronto Eaton Centre, which is the massive downtown Toronto mall that's actually quite nice. Now, among Torontonians, the path is really famous for being confusing. But honestly, I don't think it's that bad. What can be confusing is that when you're within a single building, there tends to be a ton of different corridors, sometimes multiple levels, and it's a little disorientating. But once you have a general sense of what building you're located in and the cardinal directions, you can generally find your way to wherever you need to go by just say going east if you need to go east and going west if you need to go west. I also have to say that wayfinding has improved significantly even since I've moved to Toronto with much better maps and more clear signs being available widely in the network. This was a previous issue because as I mentioned before, since the system was sort of decentralized, you didn't have a great single unified wayfinding system. Now to be totally clear, the path network is far from perfect and I actually wish it extended much further. In particular, to the northwest it's sort of lacking. Uh, the path network kind of extends to the northeast side of downtown, but not the hospitals in particular at the northwest, and I think connecting more of them would be fantastic. Uh, to be clear though, you can access the hospitals, just not necessarily by walking. You'd have to get on the subway and then get off at a station that's adjacent to them, and then you can usually walk to the hospitals indoors. It would be nicer if you could just walk the whole way indoors, especially since if you're coming in from say a regional train, that would mean getting on a subway train and with our current fare scheme, paying an extra fare. It's very silly. There's also a weird sort of missing link where there's a bunch of buildings northwest of Union Station and a bunch of stuff southwest of Union Station that aren't connected across Front Street. And a connection across Front Street would be oh so nice for improving connectivity in the western part of the network. Now, one of the worst missing links in the network is literally directly northwest from Union Station. But interestingly, this is the first publicly owned section of the PATH network that was built by the City of Toronto, who now organizes the network in general, but doesn't necessarily construct it. It's, again, decentralized. Uh, this short section connects Union Station across Front Street, but doesn't go further. And so a further extension of it would be absolutely amazing for providing better connectivity overall. What's perhaps even more interesting is that not only Toronto, but Montreal also has a similar network to the path called the Reso. What this means is that depending on where you live, you could travel onto the subway to Union Station in Toronto, across to Montreal in a different province, and then get off your train, go to say a Montreal Canadiens game, stay in a hotel, and travel back to Toronto to your home, again, without ever having to go outside. And I think that's pretty cool, again, because Canadian winters are rough, especially in Montreal. I'll probably get comments if I don't mention it, but Calgary also has a similar system to the path in the Reso, but it's called the Plus 15 and it's actually above ground. And I'm gonna be honest, I think Calgary's system is a lot better. For one, you get nice views of the streets and it sort of makes it feel a little less hollow than the path, which in some places feels kind of dark and dingy. The other nice thing about the Plus 15 is that when you wanna build new subway lines, you don't have to interact with all of these underground tunnels, which can allow for cut and cover subways. Right, Calgary? Right, Calgary? Oh, 
Now to be clear, the path does have some major problems. One thing that is incredibly frustrating is that the network is often at different levels from building to building, which means that to cross from one building to another, you often have to go up an escalator or sometimes, though rarely, a set of stairs. Uh, this is inconvenient for most people, but it makes it a bit of an accessibility nightmare for those who are less abled. And that's really frustrating because in a lot of cases, the accessible solution was sort of retrofitted in and that often includes a really long ramp or kind of inconvenient elevator or lift. And so the different levels, not the greatest thing. Another problem, and this kind of stems from the decentralized nature of its development, is that the path is not super consistent. To be fair, the wayfinding is, yes, finally consistent, but the design of the interiors of the spaces aren't. And what this means is that you can go from a really nice building to a less nice building, and you don't really have consistency. Uh, since these are individual buildings as well, there's often doors in between them, despite the fact that you're entirely underground, And that's also annoying. I believe it's for climate control reasons. Maybe one building wants to have more heat than another and they don't wanna pay for heating for the other building. Very frustrating. I think the way to solve this in the future is to have the city implement more standards so that they say, if you wanna develop and connect to the path, you have to design to this standard. I'm not sure if we'll see that, but if we do, that would be pretty cool. Now, one thing that is nice about the path is that unlike some other indoor pedestrian networks and malls and the like that you see in cities, it has really wide open opening hours. And that means that even if all of the shops around you and the offices above you are closed, you can still utilize the network to get from, say, a sports game to a location connected somewhere. And that's something that's really useful because it means that people are comfortable walking from different locations downtown to others, even late at night, because the network is pretty secure, well lit, and the like. That said, there is always a major debate about the path, about the Plus 15 in Calgary, and about other networks like this. The question is, is it good to take all of the pedestrians off of the streets, and let's be honest, not everyone is going to use the path, and have streets that are maybe a bit more dead and maybe a bit more car oriented because there are less pedestrians on them? Well, I would say yes and yes. The truth is we do need more pedestrian space on our streets. We desperately need it. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having these underground or above ground path networks that make being a pedestrian, cyclist, or transit user in a city much more convenient. I think a similar situation exists for light rail and better streets. Uh, often people act as if you need to have light rail on a street to redesign it, when the truth is you can easily redesign a street with a subway under it too. I think that's what we really need to be thinking about. How do we make our cities more pedestrian and people oriented and less car oriented? And it doesn't mean not having underground paths. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.